There is so much information available about Eye of the Beholder. Everything from cast interviews to details about the makeup process and more are widely accessible to anyone with an internet connection. On the Blu-ray, there are four commentary tracks and a 25-minute interview segment for this episode alone. It's no wonder, I suppose, because this installment of the show is one of the most well-known. It's up there with Time Enough at Last, The Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, and a few others that are recognizable one way or another to people who've never even heard of The Twilight Zone. And that attention is warranted. It without a doubt holds up to a modern critical eye and deserves its status among the best this series has to offer. But how and why does Eye of the Beholder endure? There are a plethora of reasons. Let us count them. Janet Tyler has just undergone her 11th procedure to fix her facial deformity. It's the last one allowed by the state before she'll be dealt with in a way that doesn't offend normal people who are repulsed by her appearance. Tyler's face is covered by bandages since her latest procedure, and the day has finally come to remove them. The medical team trying to help her talk amongst themselves about how sorry they feel for the woman, with her doctor especially feeling saddened by her ordeal. Just before the bandages are cut off, the leader of the state begins an address to the nation about what he calls glorious conformity. As the gauze coverings are cut into and unwrapped, the medical staff waits in anxious anticipation to see if their work has proven successful. This episode is known by another name, which makes it a bit of a rarity in that way. Eye of the Beholder was the original title, and on its first airing, that's what it was called. But Rod Serling was threatened with a lawsuit soon after, and hoping to avoid any legal problems, he changed it to the private world of darkness when it was rebroadcast. On the Blu-ray set, the episode plays with its original name over the end credits, but it seems an original print of that version wasn't found because it's in a lower quality than the rest of the fully restored HD footage. Interestingly, the alternate title appears in an extra feature where the end credits have been fully restored in HD. It seems that version of the episode was more widely available. Eye of the Beholder is what this episode is more known as though, and I think most people would say the better, slightly more appropriate title. Douglas Hayes continued his streak of iconic Twilight Zone directorial work with his favorite episode here. This aired right after the previous week's The Howling Man, which also saw Hayes at the helm. Eye of the Beholder made him 4 for 4 in the second season, and he still had two more installments to go. He put his signature stamp on this one with more outstanding visuals and a delicate way of approaching the story. In Serling's original script, the medical staff were written as unsympathetic to Janet Tyler's situation. In a stroke of brilliance that gave some pitch-perfect nuance to this episode, Hayes changed that to where they did feel sorry for the main character. They weren't acting callously toward her at all, even having the doctor take this case personally. Yes, they were working for the state, but they were shown to have authentic empathy for Tyler. Speaking of the doctor, he's played wonderfully by William D. Gordon. You may remember that name from our review of Nervous Man in a $4 Room. Douglas Hayes worked with Gordon in that episode as well, so it was only natural to bring him back here. Gordon played a very different character in this story, and he really nailed it. Since he's in shadow for most of the episode, he had to rely on his vocal inflections and body language to get across all his emotion. Why shouldn't people be allowed to be different? Why? Doctor, be careful. I know, treason. The same can be said for Maxine Stewart, who was one of two actresses who played Janet Taylor. Hayes cast her mostly for her voice, which was meant to throw the audience off, but she really impressed me with how believably she portrayed the character without the use of her face. The state is not God. It hasn't the right to penalize somebody for an accident of birth. It hasn't the right to make ugliness a crime. In fact, the only face we do see in full detail until the 19-minute mark is that of Rod Serling. The way he entered here was fantastic. It wasn't just the usual stepping into frame. We see his silhouette appear behind a facade as he moves like a ghost to face the camera and speak to us. It's creepy and an appropriate way to introduce him in a story like this one. The lighting and overall look of this episode was deliberately meticulous. Since we saw no one's face for a great while, any dialogue had to be shown creatively. This kept the actors in heavy shadow with precise blocking for when and where they moved. 
Hayes and cinematographer George T. Clemens also kept the camera moving so we didn't get too close to seeing these characters' expressions. The cinematography never looked static or dull. When the bandages were being taken off Janet, the camera was placed under them so we get a first person view of Tyler emerging from her interior darkness. This was achieved by wrapping up a fishbowl for the camera to look through, and it turned out pretty great. The hospital rooms and hallway sets also create a sense of space that added to Eye of the Beholder's trademark appearance. The music was handled this time around by the legendary Bernard Herrmann. Herman was prolific in his day, composing the music and movies from Citizen Kane to Taxi Driver. In addition to the original Twilight Zone theme, he scored three episodes prior to this one, including the iconic Walking Distance. That one had music so good, they reused elements from it a whole bunch of times throughout the series. It was a regular occurrence to reuse music back then, as CBS had their library to draw from. But for Eye of the Beholder, Herman was hired to create something original. There's only about 9 minutes of composition, but it's used when it needs to be heard, which helped the episode feel even more special. Herman would go on to later score 3 more installments of the series. Another huge aspect of this production was William Tuttle's makeup, but we can only discuss that after the twist section. If by some miracle you've never seen any of the images from this episode and have yet to sit down and watch it, you should do it. The twist is one of the biggest in the show's history, and you'll want to see it for yourself if it hasn't already been spoiled for you. The doctor fully removes Janet's bandages and remarks that the procedure didn't work. We're finally shown the face of Tyler, and it's that of a beautiful woman. The lights are then turned on and we see that everyone else has what we would consider to be deformed faces. Not wanting to live this way, Janet runs out into the hallway as the leader of the state continues his speech on conformity across the TV screens. She runs into her room with someone who, by our standards, looks to be a handsome young man. The doctor then enters to explain that the man is named Walter Smith. He's a representative of the community she'll be moving to, a community entirely made up of people of her kind. Smith comforts her and assures her she'll live a happy life there. They calmly walk off together as the medical staff all look on with pity, ending this trip into the Twilight Zone. William Tuttle did makeup effects for about a dozen episodes here. His work usually stands out, contributing to the look of whatever production he's involved in. In this case, Douglas Hayes wanted a pig-type appearance for these characters. To save money, Hayes saw Tuttle's Morlock designs from the 1960 film version of The Time Machine and asked to modify some of them for the characters in this world. The finished pieces are minimal with just a few exaggerated features glued onto each actor's face. The additional darkening under the eyes helped them come off as appropriately twisted. Supposedly, CBS was concerned it might be a bit too shocking for viewers. Conversely, Janet Revealed is played by Donna Douglas. Best known for the Beverly Hillbillies, Douglas plays her role well here. Initially, they had Maxine Stewart dub in her lines, but Douglas was able to match Stewart's deeper tone and her own voice was kept in the few lines she spoke. It was Hayes' idea to split the part for two actresses. He hoped to throw the audience off with the voice of an older woman before unmasking Douglas. It ended up being a pretty effective move. The big reveal of what these characters look like was classic Twilight Zone. Dramatic music, quick cutting, and a sense of panic spurred on the moment. Of course, Janet is terrified for a whole different reason than one would think if seeing this episode in a bubble. She considers herself to be a deformed monster and rushes out into the hallway with that super creepy telecast of the leader screaming his warped ideals of conformity. It's a phenomenal sequence. Serling and this show in general often use the tactic of something like the state forcing its narrow-minded will on the citizens of its society as a metaphor for real-world injustice. Totalitarianism and dictators were never far from Serling's work. This episode might be the greatest and most striking instance of that. Singling out a certain group and having a nation conform to one sole way of thinking are not occurrences that only happen in faraway lands, but that's not the only message Serling put into this story. It all comes back around to beauty truly being in the eye of the beholder. It's memorable, it looks amazing, it's acted very well, and the story bursts through the screen in a dramatic example of its moral. There's even more information on this classic out there, so if you're interested, take a look and discover additional details about the story and production. Regardless, this is required viewing when diving into the best of the Twilight Zone.